I'm Rafi Krikorian, and this is Technically Optimistic. First of all, thanks. Thanks for coming. Uh, it's episode five of our series on artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence or it promises uh, an enormous, enormous promise of both risks to our society and our economy and our national security, but also incredible opportunities. Incredible opportunities. Just two months ago... That's President Biden outlining what has been a central premise of our show. AI has enormous promise and simultaneously poses enormous risks. And though people are currently thinking seriously about regulation, those rules and regs are a long way away, even in the EU, and they're closer than we are in the US. And if you haven't heard the two episodes we did on this very challenge, you should check them out. Rules of the Road, parts one and two. Over the past year, my administration has taken action to guide responsible innovation. Last October, we The problem, though, is that AI is actually already here, and it's already affecting people's lives. So even though a policy solution is still far away, President Biden feels pressure to do something. And today I'm pleased to announce that these seven companies have agreed vol to voluntary commitments for responsible innovation. These commitments, which uh, the companies will implement immediately, underscore three fundamental principles. Safety, security, and trust. Voluntary commitments for responsible innovation. Effectively a blessing for these companies to self-regulate until further notice, I guess. But AI is already changing how people work, live, and express themselves, and for some, in huge ways. So today on the show, we're going to be talking about these effects that AI is having on the world right now. And we'll hear from people adapting and responding to the shifts that AI is bringing to the labor market, artistic production, and to indigenous communities. How are people changing their priorities, plans, and passions? How has AI already shaken up our society? And to us on the ground, is AI a helper or a threat? It's not always clear, but we are technically optimistic. First, let's zoom out and talk a little about economics. Worrying about the effects of new technology on society is actually a very old phenomenon. It's not unique to AI. Through the industrial and then the mechanical and then digital revolutions over the past few centuries, there's been lots of anxiety. Will people lose their jobs? Will whole industries have to shudder? And what will be lost in the face of these new efficiencies? We have always asked these questions. So if you are worried that your job could be replaced, is there anything you can do? Polling more than 8,800 workers, the CNBC survey found that about a quarter of workers, 24%, are worried that artificial intelligence will make their job obsolete. They They're, should be worried, they, should they, they, they not? They should be worried and, and they should be strategic about how they can... But is it different this time around? Which jobs is AI coming after first? If you're a middle manager, you're doomed. Any kind of commodity salesperson, report writers and journalists, accountants and bookkeepers, and oddly enough, doctors. Well, I do think there's things to be scared of. There's things to be excited about. Eric Brynjolfsson is the perfect person to talk to about this. As this technology becomes more and more powerful, it can do amazingly good things. We could have the best decade in human history up ahead. He is an economist, a senior fellow at Stanford's Institute for Human-Centered AI, and director of the Digital Economy Lab. It could also do some terrible things. We could have maybe the worst decade if we, if we play it wrong. Brynjolfsson's research focuses on the economic impacts of technology. And in books he co-authored like The Second Machine Age, he's been one of the most prescient and insightful thinkers on the topic. 
And so, naturally, he's been thinking about AI for a while now. My goal was to do the PhD joint in AI and economics because I wanted to see how it was changing the world. Went to MIT, which had a couple of the best programs. Um, I could not quite get the faculty to do both those things. So I ended up just focusing on economics. But ever since, I mean, you know, including that time, I was looking at the economics of artificial intelligence, like how is AI going to change the economy? My dissertation was on information technology and the reorganization of work. So it's been something I've been interested in a long time. What's the conventional thinking of how AI and automation is going to impact all of us? Well, you know, the capabilities of affecting basically all parts of our activities with large language models, everything that involves language <laughs> is being affected. And that's obviously a majority of the, the work in a modern economy like the United States. I mean, a lot of the people I talk to, not the academics, a lot of the regular people I talk to are actually scared. Like they're scared in the sense of like, what happens to my job in this world? Mm -hmm. Are their fears misplaced or should their fears be more nuanced? Specifically when it comes to jobs, I, I'd like to nuance it a little bit, as, as you suggest. There will be a lot of job destruction, a lot of job creation. Technology has always been creating and destroying jobs. I don't see mass unemployment or net job loss. It'll be more of a, a churn and, and restructuring and turnover. Right now, there are so many things that need to be done in our economy that only humans can do, whether it's a lot of creative work or childcare or healthcare or environmental work. So we're not running out of things for humans to do, you know, right now. Maybe you dial it far enough into the future, machines can do the full spectrum of things. But for now, there's plenty of work that humans can and should be doing. On the other hand, what we will see is changes in what humans have a comparative advantage in. And that will lead to falling wages in some areas and rising wages in other. A lot of it will be reflected more in wages than in employment. In a well-functioning economy, prices tend to adjust and wages tend to adjust and shift people around that way rather than people just having nothing to do. I expect productivity to grow quite a bit, to be more than double the rate of growth in the past, more than double the rate of growth of what the Congressional Budget Office is projecting for the 2020s. So that's going to make a bigger pie. Productivity is really what raises living standards. It's not from people working more hours or anything like that. It's from us being able to do more per hour, i.e. productivity. But that's going to be uneven. There'll be groups that are affected more than others, and it's going to take time. So if productivity is really the key thing here, how do we measure that? Like, how do we measure productivity? Maybe it's worth taking a minute to define productivity. It's actually a really interesting concept, a simple concept, I should say. It's just output divided by input. And the way that's usually operationalized in the U.S. economy is GDP is the measure of output and hours worked is the measure of input. So it's a pretty simple concept. It turns out that both the numerator and the denominator can be hard to measure. So there's issues around measuring GDP. There's issues around measuring hours. But conceptually, it's pretty straightforward. So you can do it at the individual level. You can do it at the company level. It's not just from replacing workers. If you think about that output divided by input, you could have the same number of workers, but more output. That would increase productivity. Mm -hmm. And in most of history, that's what's happened. We haven't had mass unemployment. Uh, people are still working a fair amount. Unemployment right now is close to a historic low, but we have more output than we ever had before. So tell me about what you call the productivity J-curve. The productivity J-curve is this idea that when you have a powerful new technology, whether it's artificial intelligence or before that, you know, electricity or the steam engine, it's not enough to simply buy the technology. You also have to reinvent work, reinvent skills. When American factories electrified in the 1880s and 1890s, initially there was very little productivity gain. And that's because they didn't really rethink work. They just took out the steam engine, they put in a big electric motor, and nothing much changed. It took literally 20 to 30 years until the 1920s, really, before you started getting really big productivity gains, like a doubling and tripling of productivity. And that was because they went and they rethought what a factory was. Instead of having a big steam engine in the middle, they had a bunch of separate electric motors with each piece of equipment, and they were laid out based on the flow of materials, that allowed them to be much more efficient. You had these assembly lines that were just reinventing work. For some reason, it took managers 20, 30 years to figure out that you could do things this new way. Similarly, with uh, AI and other technologies, it's not going to be enough to sort of just like say, 
I don't know, take the cashier in a bookstore and remove them and put a robot there. That would be kind of a lame way to use artificial intelligence. You need to rethink the whole process. If you do that, you'll get very large productivity gains. I am optimistic, as I often am, that this will happen a little faster this time because we already have a lot of the infrastructure in place. We already have an internet infrastructure. So it can be plugged into existing infrastructure more easily than, say, electricity was or some of the other earlier general purpose technologies. Okay. I did a study of call center operators, and we found that there was about a 35% increase in productivity for the people who were answering questions in the call center when that generative AI tool was helping them with their answers. The least experienced workers had about a 35% gain. The most experienced workers had close to a 0% gain. That aggregates up to the whole economy. I mean, so you've touched upon it exactly, like this automation versus augmentation debate. You know, your call center operator is a great example. Like you can imagine a world where we just replace call center operators. But I think what you're just arguing right now is like we can actually just make them way more effective in what they're doing. This is a really important point and one that I've been emphasizing. I wrote a paper recently called The Turing Trap, and it, it stresses the fact that I think people get trapped too much in this idea of how can we use technology, especially AI, to replicate or imitate humans. The Turing test was developed in 1950 by the British computer scientist Alan Turing, who called it the imitation game. It was a thought experiment that if a computer could deceive a human being into believing that it was human, then for all intents and purposes, we could consider that machine to be intelligent. I think it's very evocative. It's kind of uh, interesting philosophically. It's terrible as an economic strategy for two reasons. For one, it actually limits the upside a lot we can do much better (laughs) than humans. My calculator is much better than me, thankfully. That's too low a ceiling for us to aim for. But there's a second thing that troubles me about it. And that is that if you focus on automating human labor and replacing human labor with capital, that will tend to concentrate wealth and power. Mm. So then capital is much more concentrated than labor in the economy. There's a few people who own it. And inequality would grow. And not only would economic power become more concentrated, but I think ultimately political power would become more concentrated. So we both raise the ceiling and do it in a way that creates widely shared prosperity. So in my paper, The Turing Trap, I I flesh these arguments out a little bit more and basically call for us to spend a little less effort focusing on automating work and a little bit more effort on augmenting it. Well, then how do we educate business owners to actually do this? Because if if they're looking purely on the short-term timeframe and they're not thinking your way, then it's just a financial calculation for them of just like, we can eliminate workers and replace them with a machine. Well, I spend a lot of time, you know, teaching at business schools and talking to CEOs. And one of the things I tell them is that it's in their own self-interest to think about augmenting, not just automating. Let's go back to that call center example. There are companies that try to use the technology to completely automate the process. And, and I think we've all experienced unhappily those things where you call in and there's an automated voice response system that doesn't quite understand and can't handle the specific question you have. It's a very frustrating experience. As it turns out, when people call in, there are some questions the machine has a good answer to. There's also this long tail of one-off questions that the machine doesn't really have any training data for, but humans are pretty good at figuring out answers to those exceptions. So by keeping humans in the loop, you're much more likely to be able to solve the customer's question and make them feel cared for. I want to be clear, it's not always true. There are places where you are better off automating and just replacing workers. But in my experience, talking to a lot of CEOs and a lot of managers, they instinctively focus too much on automating and they don't think enough about augmenting. How should CEOs incorporate AI into their businesses? Should AI augment human labor or replace it? There's one spot where these questions couldn't be more urgent. And that's in Hollywood, where it's all up for grabs. The Writers Guild of America, or WGA, who represent thousands of film and TV writers, went on strike on May 2nd. At the other end of the bargaining table, the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, the AMPTP. There are a number of core issues that the writers say are crucial, like residuals from streaming media, 
and overall job security and compensation. But a principal concern? AI. They're trying to get computers and artificial intelligence to take the jobs of hardworking, real human beings. You lose the heart and the soul of the story you're telling if you let AI control that. I mean, the first word is artificial, and so it will always feel somewhat artificial. The Writers Guild tried to include language in their new contract that would disallow AIs from writing or rewriting material. They also asked the studios to not use writers' work as source material to train AIs in the future. But the producers rejected both proposals, instead offering annual meetings to discuss advancements in technology. It is disgusting. Shame on them. They stand on the wrong side of history at this very moment. And then, on July 14th, the Screen Actors Guild, representing over 150,000 actors and other media professionals, joined the WGA and also went on strike. AI was a central concern for SAG as well. And it's unconscionable. Fran Drescher is the president of SAG-AFTRA. That at a moment when streaming and AI and digital is so prevalent in the industry, it has disemboweled the industry that we once knew. When I do the demand, and everybody was part of the break. How serious is this threat? How close are we, really, to a sitcom script generated by ChatGPT? One that's read by digital voice clones of famous actors? And the whole thing is then synced to an animated deepfake performance by digital doubles. Oh, by the way, if you think this kind of thing is unrealistic, everything I said for the past 15 seconds has actually been an AI clone of my voice. It took like six hours and 30 bucks to make. Is this the AI Rafi speaking right now? Or is this the real one? Don't you think it's kind of hard to tell the difference? <laughs> uh. So, are Hollywood's writers and actors really in existential danger from AI? I mean, just basically for people who don't realize it yet, it's not some magical, mystical genie or something. It's just a program. That's Justine Bateman. She's a writer, director, producer, and actor. You might remember her acting across Michael J. Fox as Mallory on Family Ties, a sitcom from the 1980s, which got her two Emmy nominations. She's also a very helpful person to talk to right now. And not just because she's a member of both the WGA and SAG. She also has a computer science degree. Yeah, so I got my degree in 2016, so I have a somewhat recent education in coding. So yeah, I had AI classes and all that. And so she has some strong feelings about AI. It's just a, it's just a program. And it's more complex than what I'm going to describe, but it's just a program that you feed in a bunch of data. Mm -hmm. Like if you want it to write books, you feed it in as many digital books as possible and a dictionary and a novel formatting instruction book, et cetera. And then you give it a task. You say, I want you to write me a mystery novel and it'll spit out an amalgamation of what you fed it. Now, if you've not fed it any mystery novels at all, it won't quite know what to spit out. So it can only spit out an amalgamation of what it's been given. You feed it in a bunch of stuff, you give it a task, and it's going to spit out a result based on what you fed it. Justine's right about this, and we talked about it in our first episode. Most LLMs are examples of what the researchers Timnit Gebru and Emily M. Benber famously characterized as stochastic parrots. In other words, they produce language that seems meaningful to us, but is produced without any understanding. You know, like a parrot. What was the eye-opening moment for you? Was it ChatGPT coming out? Was it earlier than that? I mean, when did you notice that this was going to be an issue? I noticed it was going to be an issue when a friend of mine who's a really talented video artist and editor. He was messing around with AI animation some months ago. And I asked him, how much of this are you illustrating? Because he's really talented. And he said, none of it. And then it dawned on me how we're going to get rid of, quote, content. 
because for the last 10, 15 years, I've been unhappy with the treatment of film and series, uh, the treatment of filmmakers, the mistreatment of their work by categorizing as content. So when streamers and then others were referring to our films and series as content, I, I was just like, no, no, no. But then they started denigrating the work itself because they're using so much viewer habit data to almost design what that content is going to be. And this is horrible for the filmmakers. Yeah, I know one person has a series and the note he says he gets most often is, this is not second screen enough. That is horrifying. When you start referring to everything as content and everything is just reduced to what is going to fit this sort of viewer data, you've now reduced our work to something that can be automated. And especially if you're going to do reboots, remakes, sequels, rehashings, really, does this century yet have its own pop culture? It doesn't. It has pop culture from the 20th century reheated, and that's easy to automate. Is the issue you're talking about then the fact that people are using tools in an automation way versus an augmentation way, like building tools that writers could use to help them do their jobs better? Or is the issue something getting to our core humanity in some way? Like we're no longer seeing things that are high value art, and we're now seeing things that are instead cheap, effectively. For me, tech needs to solve a problem. And maybe it solves a problem you didn't know you had, like the iPhone before the iPhone came out. Did we know we needed to have a computer in our pocket? Hmm. AI in the arts does not solve any problem except the problem of these distribution ends, these entertainment companies not having a wide enough profit margin. Their profit margins are already very wide. True. So it solves the problem of insatiable greed. It does not solve a problem for a writer. A writer writes. A writer has a pretty cool tool that they use called a brain. And I don't believe that any writer needs any AI to tell them what to write. No artist needs AI to tell them what to paint. No artist needs AI to tell them what music to put together. I would never, I love writing. I would never use AI, not in a million years. Never, I would never use AI to write because I love writing. Why would I give that to some computer program to do for me? It just makes no sense to me whatsoever. So I'm not interested in it. I'm not interested in reading anything that's written by AI. I'm not interested in seeing anything rehashed, period. Honestly, whether it's by humans or AI, I want to know what's next. And this ain't it. What's next? That's only going to come from humans. It's not going to come from an AI program. I mean, by design, it's just a rehashing of the past. I think the more people understand that, the better. If you think about this as like a, a socio-technical thing, like our entire culture is now currently based around looking back and where no one's actually pointing yes. forward in some way. And it has been for the last 10, 15 years. So AI does not solve that problem. AI compounds that problem. Would you never use it to write? No. To give you 10 options of what to do next? For what? Like just to help you prompt your brain? To prompt my brain? No, I've got so many ideas. Yeah. Like in my lifetime, there's no way I would ever be able to write them all and certainly not be able to raise the money for them all and shoot them all. I wish, I wish I could. In episode two, we heard from Congressman Jay Obernolte who, like Justine, also studied computer science and AI. And he had a whole different take on the Hollywood strike. When you look at the screenwriters strike in Hollywood, AI is one of the central issues yeah. uh, in that disagreement where the screenwriters are saying, we do not want anyone to permit the use of AI to write movie scripts. Mm -hmm. And in a way, you can completely understand their point of view, right? They, they think that AI writing scripts means fewer jobs for script writers. But on the other hand, think about the potential upsides. You know, think about the fact that the use of AI enhances productivity, which means the cost of writing a script goes down, 
but also generative AI means probably the cost of creating a pilot based on some new content goes down. And if the cost of everything radically decreases, you could have an explosion in the number of new pilots, new shows, more content, which actually could greatly increase the number of available jobs for script writers. But by the way, the best script writers would be the ones that had figured out how to use AI to enhance their productivity and their creativity. So there we go, you know, that's the dilemma. So do you let a group of people say, no one can use this technology, or do you say, hey, look, it's the needs of the many versus the needs of the few, you know, who is benefiting from this and use that to guide you. And I think that that's what we have to do. The economist, Eric Brynjolfsson, basically agrees. You know, we spoke to a woman who is advocating as part of the Hollywood strike that we need to ban all AI there. Her point is twofold. One is that the producers are just simply looking for a way to eke out more cash out of the system by eliminating writers. But then two, there's a question of just like the humanity aspect of our creative output. Well, I couldn't disagree more with her. Well, the part I agree, probably the producers are looking to eke out more money. And one way to do that is by keeping humans in the loop. And in my classes, I tell the students, embrace the technology. I expect you to be more creative. And I think the writers should embrace the technology and they'll come up with fun new movies and screenplays and books that are powered in part by the interaction of humans and technology. So I think the coming decade could be one of flourishing creativity if humans and machines work together. But we're not at the stage now and we probably won't be for some long period where humans are useless in that process. They add a lot. And that's especially true not just in fiction, but in nonfiction, where the machines, as we know, they have problems with hallucination, with confabulation, where they make things up that aren't true. And you really need a human, if you're a doctor or a lawyer or an investor, to double check that work and make sure it's accurate. But I would advise the writers to embrace the technology. There's no way they're going to hold it off and prevent it. But Justine does not see it this way. For her, the stakes are too high. Well, I think the Writers Guild did a great job with their demands. They proposed the MPTP, the group of legal representatives for the studios and the streamers. And anyone who wants to use a WGA writer, you have to agree to use what the MPTP has negotiated on behalf of all the studios. When it came to AI, they said, okay, here's our proposal on AI. As a reminder, the Writers Guild sought to get the studios to agree to not let AIs write or rewrite scripts, and for members' work not to be used for AI training. And the AAPTP's response was, we reject your proposal, we are not countering it, and we're not talking about it. We will agree to discuss this technology with you in a year. And to that, the Writers Guild appropriately declared a strike. I mean, you don't need somebody on the set because there's no set. Eventually, there'll be no set. I mean, eventually, I mean soon. Be AI-generated background. You won't need a crew. You won't need the actors. It'll either be scanned or it'll be actors they made in AI. People might think this hyperbole, but you look at the demos, and I dare you to, like, find a difference between that and somebody with, like, a TikTok filter or who's had plastic surgery or something. Like, we're also very accustomed to seeing non-real faces. So it's just one click away from having AI faces. The Screen Actors Guild is demanding that no AI likenesses be made from any performer unless they give their informed consent, which they argue should be negotiated separately on any given project. They propose that our background performers should be able to be scanned, get paid for one day's pay, and their company should own that scan, their image, their likeness, and should be able to use it for the rest of eternity in any project they want with no consent and no compensation. So to do that to actors, to take their whole person, what they look like, what they sound like, how they move, and then discard them, that's just heinous. So if that's going to be their same response, it's impossible for the SAG leadership to make a deal with that. How do you think this all ends? At least in entertainment, I think it's going to go primarily AI because of the cost cutting. Like, talk about getting rid of that pesky overhead of having to pay people to do the work you're distributing. I think that people that are perpetrating that 
will tap into what has been very successful in social media, and that is people's narcissism. And they will include the viewer in either through face replacement or, you know, getting themselves scanned. And then they'll be, not only will they cut out this overhead of filmmakers, but they will be able to charge more to the user to put the user in these films. Mm -hmm. So they'll be able to upcharge people. And then I think people will start to feel kind of sick about it and feel kind of dead about it. I just, I think it's going to get very bad, but I do think there's going to be something spectacular on the other side of this. I think when people get tired of losing their jobs and they get tired of looking at themselves having been scanned in films and everything and the novelty wears off, I think there's going to be something really spectacular that's really real, really human, but I think there'll be a lot of destruction before that. Eric, you've been very optimistic with me today, but what's the downside? The impacts are not going to be equally distributed. So clearly in some places, for some people, there will have to be a downside, right? Absolutely. And, and I am concerned about that. Over the past 20 years, really, unfortunately, while we have had higher productivity, we've also had more inequality and big chunks of Americans and people in other countries have been left behind. If you're a high school educated or less, uh, your real wages have fallen on average. Um, and not just wages, we've seen life expectancy fall for that demographic. We've seen increased deaths from despair, drug abuse, alcoholism, depression. So these are really damaging, painful outcomes for big chunks of the economy. And it's not just technology. There are other forces at work, sociological forces, globalization. But the way the technology has been used has not been beneficial broadly. So looking forward, I don't want a replay of that. I want us to work a lot harder to make sure that we create shared prosperity. And one of the reasons that I'm calling for using these technologies to augment and not replace people is that I believe we have choices. You can try to use it to replace people. You can try to use it to augment people. If you go the second path, you can much more likely to shared prosperity. But I'm concerned that we won't make the right choices and we need to make a real effort. It won't happen automatically. I really love that your notion of like, we actually have choices. This is actually not inevitable. Exactly. And I would even strengthen it. I mean, these are tools and we have more powerful tools than we ever had before. So almost by definition, we have more power to change the world. And so our values become really salient. You know, when all you have is a spear or a rock, there's only so much you can do to change the world. Now we have like awesome and almost godlike technologies that can massively shape our health, our well-being, our politics. So let's think real carefully about which direction we want to point those tools. We'll be right back after a short break. Welcome back to Technically Optimistic. This week, we're talking about the effects that AI is already having on labor, creativity, and culture. We just heard from Justine Bateman on why AI is so antithetical to her creative process. But Adi Melanciano, a Brooklyn-based artist and creative technologist, has a different view on generative AI's role in her practice. So I uh, grew up as an artist and also just a lover of technology. Went to this amazing program at NYU for graduate school called Interactive Telecommunications Program. She's now a professor in that same program. Side note, I taught there too. But I was also really frustrated. I had grown up in PG County, Maryland, which is a really beautiful place to grow up and be a Black person. It's just like kind of a Black utopia. And so moving from there and going to NYU, even though New York has always been my second home and all my family is here, it's an entirely different demographic. And so it felt different because politically, Things are very different. We were moving from Obama to Trump, and so it was just a whole different kind of vibe. Being in that environment, while I loved the curriculum, I was really frustrated that I was one of the very few Black students, and there were no full-time Black professors. And so for me, it felt very natural to kind of just combine the exciting parts of my program and then also just fill that void that I felt for myself and create a space that could do that. And so Aftertopia was birthed out of that. 
Afrotectopia is an organization Meliciano founded that supports projects by Black creators at the intersection of art, design, and technology. I want Black people to be able to exist within the world in a way where their humanity is first. I feel like oftentimes race is used as a qualifier or as a way for other people. Like if you have Black attached to a title or a name or something, that it, it automatically puts a lot of things on it as opposed to us being able to exist inside of a space that is just natural to who we are. Like for me, I really want us to just as Black people exist and be and not perform and fill in what other people think that we should be filling in. Okay, that's really interesting. And it reminds me of some of the things you've written about. You've created art using AI image generators. Yeah. You've reflected on how it highlights some of the things about identity and performance. Right. How should we think about these generative tools? I mean, do you think they can reveal truths about ourselves or our society? Yes. It's not giving a realistic truth. Really, all that it's doing is just being a reflection to the dominant narrative that's online and also the dominant group of people in the way that they are interpreting people and labeling them through the metadata. Like so much of it is built off of language and language. As I, when I give talks on AI, I'm constantly reminding people that the foundation of this generative form of AI is rooted in language. It's the clip model. Mm -hmm. It's pairing images that have existed online and the captions and the way that we've used the captions and the way that we use language very much dictates our idea of identity, of values, of logic, all sorts of things. They completely control our psyche. And so when we think about how language does that, but then also who is deciding these different metrics and frameworks for the ways that we use language, which is a really small group of people, especially when we think about who's actually creating these, developing these technologies and the people that are developing them in big tech are very predominantly white men in the Western world. And so it's the way that they are using language to represent people and represent cultures and identifying nuances or missing nuances within cultures. Can you tell me more about the clip model? Yeah, so the clip model is what's been used for pairing the images that exist online and how they have been tagged through captions, language, so the metadata, pairing it together and then turning that into a way where we can use words, placing words into latent space, kind of like how Spotify understands this is what you probably want to listen to based off of your activity. Mm -hmm. So it studies the activity of language in the world. Your art involves having an AI image generator like Midjourney respond to prompts you compose. Can you tell me a little bit about your process and like what you might have discovered from it? So there are two parts of the computation anthropology. The first part where it's me doing things like grabbing images from the public domain and using the way that they caption those images, archival images from centuries ago even, and being able to render different images that look very similar to the original images, which it was fascinating within itself. So that was one part of it. Another part was using my own headshot and then applying different words on top of it attributes that are mine or aren't. I would say things like born in Miami, drinks a lot of tea, which is true. But I had other attributes that weren't true. And to see the way that it would render me, it never really rendered me correctly. It always was changing my appearance. And that would make sense. But the fact that it felt the need to change my appearance was really interesting. And the way that it would, like if I drank a lot of tea, it would then make me more Asian. Hmm. Little things like that, or the fact that I am an aunt, but it would age me by about like 30 years. So that was me studying the computer. But the way that I studied myself was through the other part of it, creating my own personalized model through Google's technology of Dream Booth, and then using that inside of Stable Diffusion. And seeing myself pose in different ways, rendering a whole new alternate reality of myself, like I was a supermodel in Egypt and drinking champagne on a yacht off of Mafi Coast. Like I was living this really extravagant and lavish life. And that lavish life was really fun to just play with in. Hmm. But the other part was just seeing my identity in entirely different ways than I've ever represented myself. I've never posed in front of a camera the way that it would render me or wore my hair in those kind of styles. So it's little things like that where I realized, oh, okay, identity, what we think is identity is really this external performance in a way that we want people to perceive us and we want them to identify us in certain ways, but it does not exist internally. Like when I'm 
doing things with no one around and I'm not communicating myself or trying to represent myself in any way. I'm not thinking about my identity at all. And so that was liberating in that I understood identity is really just this playground. I don't have to take it so seriously. Like the fact that when you become aware of this performance of identity, then you can kind of take a step back and really figure out, do you want to continue playing in that space that you're performing in? Or do you want to do something else? But also just this freeing moment of, I can do anything. I could be any person that I want to be. I could represent myself anyway. I guess, how should I think about that though? Like, you know, there's one sense of like what, I view my identity internally. There's a view of identity as other people see me or maybe as a unvarnished camera lens might see me, not distorted by AI. You're describing this other like view of a world mediated through these systems. In some way, the word glamorous you use there is tied to a value that maybe a creator gave to that word when they're making that AI system. Yes. I guess what I'm wondering is, like, is this saying something about our society or is this simply saying something about the people who create these systems? Yes, I think it's absolutely representing. It's hard to know who exactly it's representing. Yeah. I think it's representing just the people that have been most active online and the way that they represent themselves and the way that way they tag themselves in the metadata within that. But then there are also different parts of it of the developers are going in and kind of filling in the gaps within that too. So, but then I also do want to take a step back and say that with identity, you can play with it so much. For me, when I say I can be anything, it's more of, I know that still when someone looks at me, they're going to have a certain understanding because of my phenotypical nature and the way that I naturally present myself, but I also know that there's a lot more room to play within than what I thought before. I think I was very rigid in my understanding of the way that I existed within this world. And I think a lot of us are kind of really just so invested and rigid in the way that we present ourselves and don't play around enough. We don't understand how much we could play around. And that's really what I was exploring. But that's super interesting. Like, so are you basically saying this gives you more freedom? Like freedom might be a loaded word, but is this more freeing in the way that you think about what your identity is? It is more freeing for me and how I think about my identity, yes. And I think it's like, sometimes it might be, okay, I'm going to wear my hair in a way I've never worn it before. But it also is freeing in that I got to see myself represented in a certain way. And I'm satisfied with that moment of having seen myself in that way. And then I can go along not caring. Oh, that's interesting. Like, okay, I saw myself with like really great makeup. Now I can continue not wearing much makeup. And, you know, it's like, it's little stuff like that where I saw myself looking in a super cool gothic outfit. Now I have no interest in even wearing that because, not, you know. I talked to some writers and artists who see AI as something to be avoided, you know, as something very opposed to their creative practice you've kind of gone the other way on that. So what do you make of those artists who find this technology scary or threatening or dehumanizing? Yeah, I've had conversations with writers and people that are very hesitant to create with AI. And I'm like, you could talk to it. You know, you could just play around with it, see what it says, like throw in your ideas and then have this back and forth. And they're like, no, I don't want to touch it because I'm an artist and, you know, I have to stay true to my craft. And it's like, I get that. But I also think, the way that we think about artistry is that we really think that we're just like this individual who is off in our own corner, not influenced by anything, coming up with all these ideas purely by ourselves. And that's not what we're doing at all. Mm. You're setting so many different people's ways of being, and that's influencing your way of being. And so this form of technology is not that different from our current way of being creative in that it's really synthesizing a bunch of different people's understanding. And you are, you know, kind of like massaging it and trying to figure out how to pull out what it is that could align with you. So I, I just, I think there's a very drastic binary understanding. Like it's a strong dichotomy between you can either be a pure creative or you can be a creative that plays with AI. And if you are a creative that plays with AI, it takes all the value away from being a creative because now you're using something that's grabbing a bunch of other things from other people. But that's really what being a creative is all along. So I think there's a lot more space for people to play in that they don't even realize. You know, I've also spoken to people who talk about these systems as fundamentally backwards looking. All they do is create really good mishmashes of stuff they've seen before. And so they're not actually pushing us as creative beings forward in a lot of ways. They're just letting us explore backwards in a bunch of different ways. You could say that. 
But I would also, I don't, I, I'm, it's hard to say these kind of things because you don't want it to be misinterpreted. And I'm not saying that this stuff is better than us creatively. I would just say that it's just creating a new lens. It's like, yes, it is a mashup, hmm. but that mashup is something new. And it's not going to replace the ability for humans to always be able to think in ways that the AI could not. And the AI can create things that a human might not think. It's like the AI is just reflecting everything that it's ever seen. And humans can create something that an AI has never seen before, but the AI can also create something that a human has never seen before. So for me, it's just, these are different ways of creating. And one is not necessarily better than the other. I would say humans are always going to prevail. I think human creativity is always going to be able to far surpass what a computer can generate because it could only look at what it's seen, but I wouldn't devalue what it's creating. I'm hearing like a very complex like relationship with this technology. Like you have a very nuanced way of like sort of like exploring this like connection. Does that make you pro AI or does that make you we're complicated? <laughs> like for me, for one, it's just another tool. Like that's how I see it. It's like Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think it's a tool and I also see all the limitations of that tool. Like when I'm making portraits like right now with pastel, I know that it's not going to render in the same way that I'm creating with oil painting. It's much more forgiving. Like there's a whole, there's, it's, it's an entirely different world, entirely different form of creating. So when I say tool, I'm saying, yes, it's just another tool in that this is not going to replace human creativity ever. Like there's so many things that humans can do that it can never replicate. I'm saying that for one, right now it requires you to look at a screen, to use the fingertips, to type something into the keyboard. Like there's so many limitations to it. And then also foundationally in the way that it's designed, I also see it for what it is of, I'm not going as far as saying, oh my God, it's going to overtake intelligence of humans because I don't see it as actual intelligence. I see it really as just mimicking the ways of being of a really small group of people. All too often, generative AI reflects reality for only a small subset of the population. Limitations in training data can reproduce and reflect biases that exist in society. The data sets themselves and what AI developers choose to do with them are largely hidden from the public. So even if we have an awareness that bias exists in a model, it's much harder to know what we, regular people, can do about it. I've worked in human genomics for over a decade, starting with the Human Genome Research Institute. And so I've been mining genomes for over a decade. Kiyolo Fox is a genetic scientist and professor in the anthropology department at UC San Diego. But I never connected the idea of mining genomic information, data derived from human beings and its value, its worth as a resource, and making comparisons with other resources like cobalt, diamonds, water, timber. Kiyolo is a native Hawaiian, and the work he's doing with indigenous communities shows us not only how data limitations can have real effects on people's lives, he also shows us one way to push back. That, I think, was the biggest kind of breakthrough I mean, I started looking into the value of these things when 23andMe sold access to their database to GSK. It was like a big moment. GlaxoSmithKline, they put $300 million into the genetic startup, that's 23andMe. What they get for that is a huge database. This is a major pharma company that is obviously looking at everything you have. What we hypothesized on from those early days when we started the company is that if you have a large amount of genetic data, you're going to start to be able to make insights that you wouldn't have otherwise ever been able to see. And then there was another acquisition. And I think those things really kicked things over the edge because I knew, one, how little diversity they had in their data set, and how much money they got for access. And I'm a student of population genetics, so I know what these mechanisms mean and how important they are for informing how we develop drug targets. I think people are extremely intelligent in any community, especially historically marginalized communities. They're coming from a position where they've been exploited, and so they're suspicious of any type of research. People that come from our communities don't like being told
told where they come from. So the interpretation of our diasporic trajectories and our just migratory history broadly, that's a really sensitive issue for most indigenous communities. So there's like the medical actionability and the way that that data feeds directly into the development of the next generation of therapeutics, which have an immense value financially. And then there's the narrativization of the genome and how that directly impacts people's identity. I mean, most people that I talk to get so worried about biases in the systems that are being built. So like data being excluded, which cause these systems not to have a fuller picture when they sort of go through their AI tasks, whatever those might be. You're also maybe advocating for, we don't want these systems to be biased, but we want to be compensated to help you unbias these systems. Is that a succinct way of saying it? Definitely. That's a beautiful way of saying it. I think we see the manifestation of bias in a lot of different data science tasks. And the genome is a really unique one because we know that the vast majority of sequencing that we've done has been in Western European populations. So if you really think about what that means, it means that something like, I don't know, 96 to 98% of these studies are done in one population of people, which means that every algo we train as a test set is trained on biased rain catchment of data. And that means that the alternatives that are kind of output from that are going to be biased towards solutions for one population of people. Now, if we layer that with the fact that 95% of clinical trials exclusively feature individuals of Western European ancestry, we get into this super kind of like brave new world of health disparities. We should be recruiting people that really reflect the diversity we see every day, but we're not, and we're missing out on a lot of data. So what we've done is we've said, all right, we want to disproportionately recruit historically marginalized people, but we're also going to give them agency and ownership of their data. We're going to give people the freedom to think about what happens with the biological material, right? So after we process your blood sample, do we destroy it? How do we dispose of it? If it's kept in a biobank, are we transparent about that relationship? And then there's another education piece on the back end, which is what are we doing with the data? How transparent are we about what we're doing with the data? If it's commodified, do you receive a piece of the pie? And that's where these larger ideas around benefit sharing come from. The Native Biodata Consortium is the first indigenous-led biological and data repository. We're always having people uh, coming here to study us. And we don't realize while that's happening that we're being exploited. The idea is that if you collect a lot of data from a lot of different people in this genomic space that you'll be able to create solutions for mankind. But because of our not only unique history with uh, Europeans, but also our unique history in the places that we live, our data is very valuable and will help the world, but we'll be the last recipients of that help. That money should be ours because it belongs to us, the data belongs to us. You're working on giving an indigenous community back ownership of their data. Right. And in this case, it's their biological data from pharmaceutical companies. But I'm curious, could this scale up? Like, could we generalize that to all communities and all our data? Yeah, that is a really complicated question and a really good one, and I love it. I think the value proposition for a lot of our communities should be all of these drugs are made in a one-size-fits-all manner for other communities of people. Mm. So the efficacy or what in genomics we call the pharmacogenomics effects of these aren't tailored for you. If we want to move towards personalized medicine and precision medicine, which we do, yeah. and using all of these incredible tools to do that, we really have to think about it from a community and population level first. But the flip side of that is you can actually gain new novel mechanisms and insights from engaging indigenous communities because our genomes are a reflection of extreme environments, high elevation, remote archipelagos in the Pacific. And these, much like Darwin's finches, those 
migratory histories shape our genomes and lead to the development of new biological mechanisms. And those things are relevant to everyone and can increase the types of therapy that we develop. So what does the infrastructure then need to look like? So you could think about it horizontally, saying we want to change standards at existing companies, but standards are like toothbrushes. Everybody has one, but nobody wants to share. <laughs> and so you can also innovate vertically and say, actually, man, we're in control of every single component that goes into this. So we did this with and continue to do this with the Native Biodata Consortia. And what we do is we're in control of the land where our biobank is, our sequencing center, our cloud infrastructure for data storage. The people we train, we're training the next generation of indigenous data scientists internally so that we're prioritizing issues around ethics and indigenous data sovereignty and governance. When you're in vertical control of all of the components, you control the standard of the product. And that's another way, I think, to push and disrupt the, the whole industry. I mean, I love this because like, you know, a lot of the questions on the podcast are around who gets to make decisions, who gets to be in control. These big companies, they've centralized control within their engineering departments that impact hundreds of millions of people. But like you're trying to basically flip that on its head of just like, we will be in control. We will be the people that are engaging. It's our data. It's our community and building the infrastructure around that in order to engage with us you need to go through our local mechanism. Absolutely. I think that is one of the most exciting ideas and trajectories for a lot of the science we're doing. The only way to flip it the other direction is to say, well, why don't we create smaller networks of miniature biobanks, miniature cloud servers, and distribute the labor and the innovation amongst communities, because you can pop up and build smaller pieces of infrastructure embedded within community. And what that does is it all, by decentralizing it, you're also de-black boxing it. So you are in effect creating transparency and literacy around these things that communities distrust. With the Native Biodata Consortia, we have a small campus on the Cheyenne River Reservation it seems to really resonate with the community. We've been able to train the next generation of sciences locally. Man, these kids are smart. But also the type of knowledge we're imparting on them opens up the possibilities of like, what are these entry points for precision medicine locally, synthetic biology locally, computation locally. And that is only going to continue to grow. But you also try and provide like, education about AI itself, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think the potential of AI-related tools right now is so cool and intoxicating and interesting and exciting, but it also brings up this just larger series of ethical questions I think that everyone is having right now. A lot of people are looking to the same pundits for expertise. Mm. They're going to this whole, like, Oxford University canon of the way that AI should be operationalized. Mm. And from that point of view, it really looks like a continuation of a lot of the forms of bias we've seen, even in the way we like sound the alarm on the ethics of the utilization of these tools, right? So we should have more conversations about that for sure. When we're building literacy and fluency amongst our communities, I always start off by saying, how many computer languages, scripting languages, do you know that were created by indigenous people? And the reality is there's one that everyone uses. It's quite ubiquitous, and it's R. Yeah. R was created by Rossi Haka, who's a Maori man from the University of Auckland. So I point to that always to say, like, look what's possible. Indigenous languages go extinct every day. It's really sad. There are a lot of parallels with, like, how indigenous people think about the world and how we create data structures and how we transfer and understand knowledge and how we create our identity, what is stopping us from creating new scripting languages that wield machine intelligence in new ways that empower our communities? Literally nothing. We are thinking about all of these new and exciting applications of machine intelligence, whether it's like federated learning approaches to compare and protect and safeguard access to data 
or the applications of new forms of art. The possibilities are quite limitless. And for the first time, you will see Indigenous people in a complete position of innovation and control. So it's going to be very exciting. On the next episode of Technically Optimistic, we're going to go wide and talk responsibility. Who's responsible for making the AI seem more human? There's a lot of interest in building AI that starts to feel supportive and caring and respectful of you. Who's responsible for the view that tech can solve all our problems? Social fairness and mathematical fairness are not always the same thing. Who's responsible for vetting AI research? We've been chasing all this kind of fame and reputation and interest to the point that our papers were really just rather sloppily created papers of the products. And in a society where hate, conspiracy, and disinformation flow freely, who is responsible for the truth? I'm actually shocked that the US government allowed large language models out we take on some of the biggest ethical and political questions raised by AI. And we've got some absolutely amazing guests to help us think through things. That's next time on Technically Optimistic. Technically Optimistic is produced by Emerson Collective with original music by Maddie Safer. For updates, additional content, and engaging discussions, follow us on social media. You can find us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook at Emerson Collective. I'm Rafi Krikorian. See you next week on Technically Optimistic.